Chapter 62, The Dark. A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whale boat pushes off from the ship with the headsman or whale killer as temporary steersman and the harpooner or whale fastener pulling the foremost oar, the one known as the harpooner, harpooner oar. Now, it needs a strong, nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish. For often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of 20 or 30 feet. But however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the utmost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated, loud, and intrepid exclamations, and what, it, and what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass while all the other muscles are strained and have started, what that is none but those who have tried it. For one, I cannot brawl very heartily and work very recklessly at one and the same time. In this straining, brawling state then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the exciting cry, stand up and give it to him. Mm -hmm. He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn around on the center halfway, seize his harpoon from the crotch, and with what little strength may remain, he assess, essays, to pit, uh, essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of 50 fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and distract, disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners, whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harpooner that makes the voyage. And if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when most wanted? Again, if the dart, uh, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat header and harpooner likewise start to running fore and aft to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and everyone else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bow of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all, all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery, it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as, as the before described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dark, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet from, from out of idleness and not from out of toil. Chapter 63. The crotch. Out of the trunk, the branches grow. Out of them, the twigs. So, in, pro in productive subjects, grow the chapters. The crotch alluded to on a previous page deserves independent mention. It is a notched stick of a peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicu ugh, perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunwale near the bow. For the purpose of furnishing a rest for the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked, barbed, and slopingly projects from the prow. Thereby, the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as readily from its rest as a backswoman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons re reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line. The object being this, to dart them both, if possible, one instantly after the other, into the same whale. So that if, in the coming drag, one should draw out, the other may still retain a hold. 
It is a doubling of the chances, but it very often happens that owing to the instantaneous violent convulsive running of the whale upon receiving the first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron into him. Nevertheless, as the second iron is already connected with the line and the line is running, hence that weapon must, at all events, be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat somehow and somewhere else the most terrible jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumbled into the water, it accordingly is in such cases, the spare coils of box line, mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat in most instances prudently practicable. But this critical act is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishly curveting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them, and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor in general is it possible to secure it again until the whale is fairly captured in a corpse. Consider now how it must be in the case of four boats all engaging one unusually strong, active, and knowing whale, when owing to these qualities in him, as well as to the thousand concurring accidents of such an audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him. For, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend onto the line should, be, should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important however intricate passages in scenes hereafter to be painted. Chapter 64, Stubbs' Supper. Stubbs' whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm. So forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we 18 men with our 36 arms and 180 thumbs and fingers slowly toiled, hour after hour upon that inert sluggish corpse in the sea and it seemed hardly to budge at all except at long intervals good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved for upon the great canal of hang ho or whatever they call it in china four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky frightened freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand arcy we towed heavily forged along as if laden with pig lead in bulk. Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way, till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of, se one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, and then, handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin and did not come forward again until morning. Though in overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so. Yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction or impatience or despair seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object. Very soon, you would have thought from the sound on the Pequod's decks that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links, the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored. Tied by the head to the stern and by the tail to the bows, the whale now lies with its black hell close to the vessels. And seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together like colossal bullocks, where, whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. If moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, stub his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in that the staid Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak, a steak, ere I sleep. You, Dago, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small. 
Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not as a general thing, and according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before realizing the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight, that steak was cut and cooked and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil. Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueteer on whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasting on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the slap, sharp slapping of their tails against the hull within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side, you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen black waters and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. And this particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark they thus leave on the whale may best be likened to the hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. Though amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks, like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them. And though, while the valiant butchers over the deck table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasseled, the sharks also, with their jewel-hilt mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat. And though, were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing. That is to say, a shocking, sharkish business, enough for all parties. And though sharks are also, also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, symmetric, systematically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere or a dead slave to be decently buried, and though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places, and occasions when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast, yet is there no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers or in gayer or more jovial spirits than around a dead sperm whale moored by night to a whale ship at sea. If you have never seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the proprietary of devil worship and the expediency of conciliating the devil. But as yet, Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him, no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own Epicurean lips. Cook, cook, where's that old fleece? He cried at length, widening his legs still further as if to form a more secure base for his supper and at the same time darting his fork into the dish as if stabbing with his lance. Cook, you cook, sail this way, cook! The old black, not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour, came shambling along from his galley, for like many old blacks there was something the matter with his knee pans, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans. This old fleece, as they called him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongs, which, after a clumsy fashion, were made of straightened iron hoops. This old ebony floundered along, and in obedience to the word of command, came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stubb's sideboard, when with both hands folded before him and resting on his two-legged cane, he bowed his arched back still further over, at the same time sideways inclining his head so as to bring his best ear into play. Cook, said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth. Don't you think this steak is rather overdone? You've been beating this steak too much, Cook. It's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good, a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks now over the side, don't you see they prefer it tough and rare? What a shindy they are kicking up. Cook, go and talk to them. Tell them they're welcome to help themselves civilly and in moderation, but they must keep quiet. 
Blast me if I can hear my own voice. Awake, hook, and deliver my message. Here, take this lantern, snatching one from his sideboard. Now then, go and preach to him. S sullenly taking the offered lantern, old fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks. And then, with one hand dropping his light low over the sea so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs, and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice, began addressing the sharks, while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overheard all that was said. Fellow critters, I's ordered here to say that you must stop dat them noise there. You hear? Stop dat them smackin' of the lip. Master Stubb say that you can fill your damn bellies up to the hatchings, but by gar, you must stop that damn racket. Cook, here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder. Cook! Why, damn your eyes, you mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That's no way to convert sinners, cook. Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, suddenly turning to go. No, cook, go on, go on. Well then, beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax him to it, try that. And Fleece continued. Do you is all sharks? and by nature very voracious, yet I say to you fellow critters that that voraciousness top that damn slapping of the tail. How you think to hear, suppose you keep up such a damn slapping and biting there. Cook, cried Stubb, collaring him. I won't have that swearing. Talk to them gentlemanly. So once more the sermon proceeded. Your voraciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame you so much for. That is nature and can't be helped. But to govern that wicked nature, that is the point. You is sharks, certain, but if you govern the shark in you, well, then you be angel. For all angel is nothing more than the shark well governed. Now look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil, a helping yourselves from that whale. Don't be tearing the blubber out of your neighbor's mouth, I say. Is not one shark good right as the other to that whale? And by gar, none of you has the right to that whale. That whale belonged to someone else. I know some of you has a very big mouth, bigger than others, but then the big mouth sometimes has the small bellies, so that the bigness of the mouth says not to swallow with, but to bite off the blubber for the small fry of sharks that can't get into the scrounge to help themselves. Well done, old fleece cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. <laughs> no use going on. On them damn willins will keep a scrounging and a slapping each other, Master Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn gluttons as you call them till their bellies is full and their bellies is bottomless. And when they do get them full, they won't hear you then. For then they sink in the sea, go fast asleep on the coral, and can't hear nothing at all, no more, forever and ever. Upon my soul, I am about of the same opinion, so give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cussed fellow critters, kick up the damnedest row as ever you can. Fill your damn bellies till they bust and then die. Now cook, said Stubb, <laughs> resuming his supper at the capstan. Stand just where you stood before. They are over against me and pay particular attention. All attention, said Fleece, again stooping over his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile. I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, cook? What's that got to do with the steak, said the old black testily. Silence, how old are you, cook? About 90, they say, he gloomily muttered. And have you lived in this world hard upon 100 years, cook, and don't know how to cook a whale steak? 
rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word so that the morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, Cook? Hind a hatchway in a ferry boat going over the Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat, that's queer too. But I want to know what country you were born in, Cook. Didn't I say the Roanoke country, he cried sharply. No, you didn't, Cook, but I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. You must go home and be born over again. You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet. Well, bless my soul if I cook another one, he growled angrily, turning round to depart. Come back, Cook. Here, hand me those tongs. Now take that bit of steak there and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it, is that steak cooked as it should be? Take it, I say, holding the tongs towards him. Take it and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old Negro muttered, Best cooked steak I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook, said Stubb, squaring himself once more. Do you belong to the church? I passed one once in Cape Town, said the old man sullenly. And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, where you doubtless overheard a holy parson addressing his hearers as his beloved fellow creatures, have you, Cook? And yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, eh? said Stubb. Where do you expect to go, Cook? To bed very soon, he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast, heave to, I mean when you die, Cook, it's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When this old, old black man dies, said the Negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, he himself won't go nowhere, but some blessed angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four as they fetched Elijah? And fetch him where? Up there, said Fleece, holding his tongs straight over his head and keeping it there very solemnly. So then, you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? And don't you know that the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't, that, didn't say that at all, said Fleece, again in the sulks. You set up there, didn't you? And now look yourself and see where your tongs are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lover's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there, except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders. Do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand and clap the other on top of your heart when I'm giving my orders, Cook. What? That your heart there? That's your gizzard. Aloft, aloft, that's it. Now you have it. Hold it there now and pay attention. All attention, said the old black, with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, Cook, you see, this whale steak of yours was so very bad that I have to put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale steak for my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it, you hear? And now tomorrow, cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins, have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused cook. There, now you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the midwatch. Do you hear? Away ye sail then. Hello, stop, now make a bow before you go. A vast heaving again. Whale balls for breakfast. Don't forget. Wish by gore whale eat him instead of him eat the whale. I'm blessed if he ain't more of a shark than Master Shark himself, muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Thanks. <laughs> the, chapter 65, The Whale is a Dish. That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp. And like Stubb, 
eat him by his own light, as you may say. This seems so outlandish a thing that one must needs go a little into the history and philosophy of it. It is upon record that three centuries ago, the tongue of the right whale was esteemed a great delicacy in France and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry VIII's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbecued porpoises, which you remember are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to, be, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced, might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is that among his hunters, at least, the whale would by all hands be considered a noble dish were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit down before a meat pie nearly 100 feet long, it takes away your appetite. Only the most unprejudiced of men like Stubb nowadays partake of cooked whales, but the equinox are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales and have rare old vintages, vintages of prime old train oil. So Granda, one of their most famous doctors, recommends strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen who long ago were accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the moldy scraps of whales, which had been left ashore after trying out the blubber. Among the Dutch whalemen, these scraps are called fritters, which indeed they greatly resemble being brown and crisp and smelling something like old Amsterdam housewives' donuts or oily, oily cooks when fresh. They have such an eatable look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the whale as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is esteemed a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the permaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of, of, of absorbing it into some other substance and then partaking of it. In the long try watches of the night, it is a common thing for the seamen to dip their ship bistic, biscuit into the huge oil pots and let them fry there a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish the casket of the skull is broken into with an ax, and the two plump whitish lobes being withdrawn precisely resembling two large puddings. They are then mixed with flour and cooked into a most delecta delectable mess in flavor somewhat resembling calf's head, which is quite a dish among some epicures, and everyone knows that some young bucks among the epicures by continually dining upon calves' brains, by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to tell a calf's head from their own heads, which, indeed, requires uncommon discrimination. And that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent-looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The head looks a sort of reproachfully at him with an et tu expression. It is not, perhaps, entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous 
that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence that appears to result in some way from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea and eat it too by its own light. But no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it, if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of a cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who is not a cannibal? I tell you, it will be more tol tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against a coming famine. It will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in that pas de foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? And that is adding insult to injury, is it? Look at your knife handle there, my civilized and enlightened gourmet, dining off that roast beef. What is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother of the very ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose with a feather of the same fowl? And with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Chapter 66, The Shark Massacre. When in the southern fishery, a captured sperm whale, after long and weary toil, is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in, for that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed, and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore, the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send everyone below to his hammock till daylight, with the reservation that, until that time, anchor watches shall be kept, that is, two and two, for an hour each couple, the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well. But sometimes, especially upon the line in the Pacific, this plan will not answer at all, because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass that were he left so far, that were he left so for six hours, say, on a stretch little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning. In most other parts of the ocean, however, where these fish do not so largely abound, their wondrous voracity can be at times considerably diminished by vigorously stirring them up with sharp whaling spades, a procedure notwithstanding, which in some instances only seems to tickle them into still greater activity. But it was not thus in the present case with the Pequod's sharks, though, to be sure, any man unaccustomed to such sights, to have looked over her side that night, would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese and no sharks, the maggots, in it. Nevertheless, upon Stubb seeing the anchor watch after his supper was concluded, and when, accordingly, Quig-quig and a forecastle seaman came on deck. No small excitement was created among the sharks for immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid sea. These two mariners, darting their long whaling spades, kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks 
by striking the keen steel deep into their skulls, seemingly their only vital part. But in the foamy confusion of, the mixed, of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their mark, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They ver viciously snapped, not only at each other's dissemble, dissembled bowelments, but like flexible bows bent round and bit their own till those entails, entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth to be uh, oppositely voided by the gaping wound. Nor was this all. It was unsafe to meddle with the corpses and ghosts of these creatures, a sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones after what might be called the individual life had departed. Killed and hoisted on deck for the sale of his skin, one of these sharks almost took poor Queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw. Queequeg no care what God made him shark, said the savage, agonizingly lifting his hand up and down. Whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but to God what made shark must be one damn engine. Chapter 27, Cutting In. It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath, Sabbath as followed. Ex officio professors of Sabbath breaking are all whalemen. The ivory Pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. You would have thought we were offering up 10,000 red oxen to the sea gods. In the first place, the enormous cutting tackles, among other ponderous things comprising a cluster of blocks generally painted green and which no single man can possibly lift, this vast bunch of grapes was swayed up to the main top and firmly lashed to the lower masthead, the strongest point anywhere above a ship's deck. The end of the hawser-like rope winding through these intricacies was then conducted to the windlass, and a huge lower block of the tackles was swung over the whale. To this block, the great blubber hook, weighing some 100 pounds, was attached. And now suspended in stages over the side, Starbeck and Stubb, the mates, armed with their long spades, began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook just above the nearest of the two side fins. This done, a broad, semicircular line is cut round the hole. The hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew, striking up a wild chorus, now commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass. When instantly the entire ship careens over on her side, Every bolt in her starts like the nailheads of an old house in frosty weather. She trembles, quivers, and nods her frightened massheads to the sky. More and more she leans over to the whale, while every gasping heave of the windlass is answered by a helping heave from the billows, till at last a swift, startling snap is heard. With a great swash, the ship rolls upwards and backwards from the whale and the triumphant tackle rises into sight, dragging after it the disengaged, semicircular end of the first strip of blubber. Now as the blubber envelops the whale, precisely as the rind does an orange, so is it stripped off from the body, precisely as an orange is sometimes stripped by spiralizing it. For the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continuously keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water. And as the blubber in one strip uniformly peels off along the line called the scarf, simultaneously cut by the spades of Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, and just as fast as it is peeled off, and indeed by that very act itself, it is all the time being hoisted higher and higher aloft till its upper end grazes the main top. The men in the windlass then cease heaving, and for a moment or two, the prestigious blood-dripping mass sways to and fro as if to let down from the sky, and everyone present must take good heed to dodge it when it swings, else it may box his ears and pitch him headlong overboard. 
One of the attending harpooners now advances with a long, keen weapon called a boarding sword. In watching his chance, he dexterously slices out a considerable hole in the lower part of the swaying mass. Into this hole, the end of the second alternating great tackle is then hooked so as to retain a hold upon the blubber in order to prepare for what follows. Whereupon, this accomplished swordsman, warning all hands to stand off, once more makes a scientific dash at the mass, and with a few sidelong, desperate, lunging slicings, severs it completely in twain, so that while the short lower part is still fast, the long upper strip, called a blanket piece, swings clear and is all ready for lowering. The heavers forward now resume their song, and while the one tackle is peeling and hoisting a second strip from the whale, the other is slowly slackened away, and down goes the first strip through the main hatchway right beneath into an unfurnished parlor called the blubber room. Into this twilight apartment, sundry nimble hands keep coiling away the long blanket piece as if it were a great live mass of plated serpents. And thus the work proceeds. The two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously, both whale and windlass heaving, the heavers singing, the blubber room gentlemen coiling, the mates scarfing, the ship straining, and all hands swearing occasionally by way of assuaging the general friction. Chapter 68, The Blanket. I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged, but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from 8 or 10 to 12 and 15 inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistent and thickness, yet in point of fact, there are no arguments against such a presumption because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber and the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True, from the unmarred dead body of the whale, you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin, transparent substance, somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of isinglass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin. That is, previous to being dried, when it not only contracts and thickens, but becomes rather hard and brittle, I have several such dried bits, which I use for marks in my whale books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with that fancying it exerted a magnifying influence. At any rate, it is pleasant to read about the whales through their own spectacles, as you may say. But what I am driving at here is this. That same infinitely thin isinglass substance, which, I admit, invests the entire body of the whale, is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature, as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it were simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale then, when this skin, as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of 100 barrels of oil, and when it is considered that in quantity, or rather weight, that oil in its express state is only three-fourths and not the entire substance of the coat, some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass, a mere part of whose integument yields such a take of liquid as that. 
Reckoning 10 barrels to the ton, you have 10 tons for that net weight of only three quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life, the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably, it is all over obliquely crisscrossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks in thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the Isinglass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to the quick, observant eye, these linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for far other delineations. These are hieroglyphical. That is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of pyramids hieroglyphics, then that is the proper word to use in the present connection. By my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks too, the mystic marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing. Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back and more especially his flanks, effaced in great part of the regular linear appearance by reason of numerous rude scratches, although of an irregular random aspect. I should say that those New England rocks on the seacoast, which Agassi imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of their species. A word or two more concerning the matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces, called blanket pieces. Like most sea terms, this one is a very happy and significant, for the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber as in a real blanket or counterpane, or, still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cozy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers, in all seas, times, and tides. What would become a Greenland whale say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cousin surtout. Sure, true, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in these Hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg as a traveler in winter would bask before an in fire. Whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood, freeze his blood, and he dies. How wonderful is it then, except after explanation, that this great monster, to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those arctic waters, where, when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found months afterwards perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice as a fly is found glued in amber. But more surprising is it to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo Negro in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality and the rare virtue of thick walls, and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. O oh, man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou, too, remain warm among ice? Do thou, too, live in this world without being of it? Be cool at the equator? 
keep thy blood fluid at the pole? Like the great dome of St. Peter's, and like the great whale, retain, O man, in all seasons a temperature of thine own. But how easy and how hopeless to teach these fine things. Of erections, how few are domed like St. Peter's. Of creatures, how few fast as the whale. Chapter 69, The Funeral. All in the chains, let the carcass go astern. The vast tackles have now done their duty. The peeled white body of the beheaded whale flashes like a marble sepulcher. Though changed in hue, it has not perceptibly lost anything in bulk. It is still colossal. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks, and the air above vexed with rapacious flights of screaming fowls whose beaks are like so many insulting poniards in the whale. The vast, white, headless phantom floats further and further from the ship, and every rod that it so floats, what seems square roods of sharks and cubic roods of fowls, augment the murderous din. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship that hideous sight is seen. Beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, upon the fair face of the pleasant sea, wafted by the joyous breezes, the great mass of death floats on and on till lost in infinite, infinite perspectives. There is an almost doleful and most mocking funeral. The sea vultures all pious in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled. In life, but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it. But upon the banquet of his funeral, they most piously do pounce. Oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free. Nor is this the end. Desecrated as the body is, a vengeful ghost survives and hovers over it to scare. Espied by some timid man of war or blundering discovery vessel from afar, when the distance obscuring the swarming fowls nevertheless still shows the white mass floating in the sun and the white spray heaving high against it, straight away the whale's unharming corpse with trembling fingers is set down in the log. Shoals, rocks, and breakers hereabouts, beware. And for years afterwards, perhaps, ships shun the place, leaping over it as silly sheep leap over a vacuum because their leader originally leaped there when a stick was held. There's your law of precedence. There's your utility of traditions. There's the story of your obstinate survival of old beliefs never bottomed on the earth and now not even hovering in the air. There's orthodoxy. Thus, while in life the great whale's body may have been a real terror to his foes, in his death his ghost becomes a powerful, powerless panic to a world. Are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? There are other ghosts than the Cock Lane one, and far deeper men than Dr. Johnson who believe in them. Chapter 70 the Sphinx. It should not have been admitted that previous to completely stripping the body of the Leviathan, he was beheaded. Strip it, uh, beheaded. Now the beheading of the sperm whale is a scientific anatomical feat upon which experienced whale surgeons very much pride themselves and not without reason. Consider that the whale has nothing that can properly be called a neck. On the contrary, where his head and body seem to join, there, in that very place, is the thickest part of him. Remember also that the surgeon must operate from above, some eight or ten feet intervening between him and his subject, and that subject almost hidden in a discolored, rolling, and oftentimes tumultuous and bursting sea. Bear in mind, too, that under these untoward circumstances, he has had to cut many feet deep in the flesh, and in that subterraneous manner, without so much as getting one single peep into the ever-contracting gash thus made. 
he must skillfully steer clear of all adjacent, interdicted parts and exactly divide the spine at a critical point hard by its insertion into the hull. Do you not marvel then at Stubbs' boast that he demanded but 10 minutes to be head a sperm whale? When first severed, the head is dropped astern and held there by a cable till the body is stripped. That done, if it belong to a small whale, it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of. But with a full-grown leviathan, this is impossible, for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one-third of his entire bulk, and completely to suspend such a burden as that, even by the immense tackles of the whaler, this were as vain a thing to attempt as to attempt weighing a Dutch barn in jeweler's scales. The Pequod's whale being decapitated and the body stripped, the head was hoisted against the ship's side about halfway out of the sea, so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by its native element. And there, with the strained craft steeply leaning over to it, by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower masthead, and every yard arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves. There, that blood dripping head hung to the Pequod's waist like the giant Holofernes from the girdle of Judith. When this last task was accomplished, it was noon, and the seamen went below to their dinner. Silence reigned over, over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck, an intense copper calm like a universal yellow lotus was more and more unfolding its noiseless, measureless leaves upon the sea. A short space elapsed, and up into this noiselessness came Ahab alone from his cabin. Taking a few turns on the quarter deck, he paused to gaze over the side, and then slowly getting into the main chains, he took Stubbs' long spade, still remaining there after the whale's decapitation, and striking it into the lower part of the half-suspended mast, placed its other end, crutch-wise, under one arm, and so stood leaning over with eyes attentively fixed on this head. It was a black and hooded head, and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. Speak, thou vast and venerable head, muttered Ahab which though ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there lookest hoary in mosses, with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid the world's foundations, where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot. Where in her murderous hold this frigid earth is ballasted with the bones of millions of the drowned. There in that awful water land, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where bell or diver never went, hast slept by many a sailor's side where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from the flaming ship heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave true to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck. For hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, and his murderers still sailed on unharmed, while swift lightning shivered the neighboring ship that would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. Sail ho, cried a triumphant voice from the main masthead. Aye, well now that's cheering, cried Ahab, suddenly erecting himself, while whole thunderclouds swept aside from his brow. That lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man. Wear away, three points on the starboard bow, sir, and bringing down a breeze to us. Better and better, man. Would now St. Paul would now St. Paul would come along that way and to my breezelessness bring his breeze. O nature and O soul of man, how far beyond all utterance are your linked analogies. Not the smallest atom stirs or lives in matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind.